So in the last lecture, we created the standard template for alpha strategies and how to test our ideas. But of course, we used um, play signals that were random. And in this lecture, we are going to try to implement it on a real strategy. And if you have your own ideas, you can, of course, program your own signal into the code. But for, for demonstration, you're just going to use um, the formulate alphas from our website. So if you go to our website, um, there are these formulate alpha posts, right? And you can just look through this if you want some ideas. And let's download the PDF and see what kind of ideas we can get. Um, we're also going to we're going to use two formulaic alphas. Okay, so let's download this also. Right. And we're going to create the alpha classes. So okay, before that I to save these files so that we can download the code later. So we're just going to save this three into a we're going to compress that and put this as set one. So you can we will upload this later and you can use it as a reference checkpoint. So anyway, we said that we want to implement real strategies and we are downloading those formulaic alpha papers. And we've already downloaded those things, so um, let me pull that up. Okay. So these are the two formulaic alpha reports. Um, we will implement this uh, formulas in our testing strategy. But this is actually one of the paid reports. So um, you would not be able to download, but I think this one you can just download from our freely available um, post. This one was from here. I'll post the links um, inside the code documents. So anyway, let's say we want to implement this and this two alpha rules as our alpha strategy and see how they perform on um, SMP data. So let me just go right here, say create a new file. Um, touch alpha one dot pi and touch alpha two dot pi. This will create two different files, and I'll just copy the whole thing over, right? Um, we we'll do from utils import uh, get PNL stats, and that's pretty much what we want to do. Let's then implement the rules. So let's just go here and let's copy and paste this whole thing into our, uh, let's say we want to compute it here, right? So let's try out this here. Let's make it a little bit prettier. So here. Okay, so um, these are the this is the rule we want to implement, and okay, let's rename this as alpha one, and this will have the same general structure, except in this alpha class, we want to instantiate non-random inputs into the alpha score. So let's see how to do that. Um, I think this bit here, so you can check out the post here to see the report. Anyhow, so let's really try to understand what this is doing. So this is quite easy to understand. Right, and then okay. So there's nothing really interesting here. This is just close, open, high, low, close, and volume data. And this this is a cross-sectional z-score. So basically, we're just doing like um, x minus mu over standard deviation of x, something like that. So there's a mean of that divided by um, this uh, difference from the center in units of the standard deviation. So nothing very interesting. We're just computing the z-score. But um, in order to compute the z-score. It also implies that you need to have data everywhere. If not, the z-score would not be valid. So there's a bit of a nuance here that we want to discuss right away. So what we we're going to do, um, let me pull up my iPad, is very simple. If we have, you know, we can compute all of this um, open, high, low, and you know, you're doing some operations here and stuff like that. We're not, this is not particularly interesting. And then we're going to get, say, um, uh, We compute that and 
And sometimes there's like entries here, and then there's entries here. Um, and um, stuff like that. So, and then let's just assume there are arbitrary entries here. Okay. But there will be empty, um, there will be empty slots. But what we're going to do is, um, we're going to assume that the, so suppose that this slot is empty, right? And then we want to compute the z-score for this um, cross-section. Because we're computing the z-score for the cross-section, if these spots are empty, then this z-score computation is not going to be exactly um, accurate based on the information that's available. We can always use the information that is the most recent. So for example, we can forward this and fill this with A before we, you know, we can fill this with G, you know, and then we can fill this with whatever data that we have. So we'll, we will use the most recently available data and then compute the z-score. Okay, so for example, here we have this row will be A, B, D, F, G, and then there will be an empty row. So suppose here is all empty. So if there is no recently available data, then we will just treat it as empty. But if there are data entries in the past, then we will just forward fill. So we're going to do something like, you know, dot forward fill, um, and then we'll do uh, something like apply uh, the score function to each of the rows, so that we can get a, another data frame that computes the, the z-score of for each element. So for example, if you have A, B, C, D, E, F, then we will, this, um, the mapping after the z-score will be A minus um, mean of A, B, C, D, E, F over standard, devi standard deviation of A, B, C, D, E, F. And uh, that will be this entry. So this entry will be replaced with this value. And then this entry will be replaced with B minus mean of a, b, c, d, e, f over standard deviation of a, b, c, d, e, f. So, um, in case that is confusing, I hope that this helps to clear up some of the uh, details of the implementation that we are going to see inside the code. So let's begin with, say, computing um, the the um, this Overruns. And anyway, we don't have to forward fill or backfill any data before we do the cross-sectional operations because otherwise, if we do any forward filling, um, like in this in this instance, it's still okay to forward fill and backward fill. But in general, for example, if you have things like um, correlation, it might not work. But it won't be accurate. So, for example, um, uh, later I'll explain this. Let's just uh, go ahead for now. So, uh, instrument df uh, will be set of df, and so this will refer to the data frame inside our dictionary. Uh, the first operation will be um, the volume. Uh, the second operator will be uh, close, stf.close, minus stf.o, minus stf.i, minus stf.close. In case you're wondering what we're doing, we're basically just um, doing this over here. So we take close minus O and high minus close. Right? And then we have the third operator, which is ncf the high and ncf the close. Okay, and then what we do is we will take all four is volume multiplied by the division of op one. Oop, you know, we have op one divided by multiplied by op 3 divided by op 4. Is it true? Okay. I'm a little confused here. Oh, okay, no. This is 2 divided by op 3. Okay. So this is basically this entire component. So we're taking volume multiplied by op 2 divided by op 3. So, okay, this is accurate. And let's collect all of this inside a list. So op 4 and so what we want to do, as we said earlier, is to fill, forward fill all of the data. So in order to do that, let's, um, we can take a look at what op4 does here, and then we can see stuff.dx is op4 equals to op4. So this will basically implicitly do the, the index alignment. And in order to demonstrate exactly how we, what this is, we're going to print out these two things. So let's just go to main.py and print out, and um, try to run that from our main file. So, um, 
do the import okay, from alpha one import alpha one. Okay, and then instead of using the random alpha, we will use this one. And then we will have um, the applying equals to alpha one the last simulation. Okay, so let's try this um, here. See what we get. Okay, so what we're doing is we're putting this fourth operation, this thing out, and then after we do the join, this will have a different index, right? So you can see here that 31st, there is data on the fourth, there is data. So when we do the join, okay, when we do this assignment, what happens is uh, the index gets implicitly aligned. And this is what we want, because now our entire universe has the same alignment for the computation. So. What we're gonna do here is just plot force dot append this. Okay, and you must note that this, even though what we did was take this and assign this to this and then append this to that, like what we have here isn't the same as what we have here because inside this very innocent looking statement, there is a very meaningful alignment of the index. Okay. And then we will go ahead and you know. After the statements, and let me just take a look at the code a little bit. Right. So we want to join, and then we'll have of course the pen of four. Okay, I just put this here. Um, it doesn't really matter, but we can just put it there. All right, so at this point, let's we already computed this across each of the individual instruments. But in order to compute a cross-sectional z-score, we really need to create a unified data frame. So um, let's just do something like force access equals one, and we can actually uh, see what is this input value, and we will get um, the value of op four for every single element. So we will get this value. For every single element. Okay, so this tempdf will give us uh, this value for 24 different stocks. And to make this less confusing, we can, of course, just rename this to um, separate ends because we did this inside a for loop, so they're all in the correct order. Okay, and so what we want to do here. Um, is done to do to compute the z score. So actually, um, I'm wondering if we can replace the inf here. So let's do because we might divide by zero here. I think that would be problematic. So um, tmtf dot replace. Um, Inf with zero and the replace native mp dot inf with zero also. Right, let's see if this works. I'm not sure um, whether that's how you use the replace function. Let me Google that. Hey, actually, it seemed to work. So, uh, takes in two arguments, one to replace, and then the value to replace it with. So, okay, luckily for us, that works just fine. And we're going to do, um, let's create a lambda function that does score equals to lambda x equals to x minus mp dot mean, x divided by mp dot standard deviation of x. So this is the z-score function, okay? And we're going to build a z-score df, so this is going to be um, MDF. As we said, we're going to use the most recently available data, so we're going to fill, forward fill the data. And then to each row, we're going to apply um, the z-score function, right? We're going to apply the z-score function to each row. So to apply to each row, specify the axis. And let's you know, see what this does. So let's put it here, and we can print it out again. 
By the way, um, if you don't know what input does, it just basically prints it out and waits for a, a keyboard input. So you can just press enter and the program will continue running. But it's not that important. So, okay, we got a we got a good um, z-score value. So this is actually precisely what we want, right? So now we are at this stage. We've already computed the z-score. Now we want to take the negative and the rolling 12 mean. And this is, well, this is really quite, this is the easy component, because now we can just do something like, um, for int, int, sub int, sub yes, int, alpha, c equals to the cross-sectional z-score df, cross-sectional z-score df, and we can refer to the column, to the instrument, then we do a rolling 12 mean, and then we just negate it by um, a negative one scalar. Um, then we can also update this to be equals to that, and we also want the value of the alpha to be non-null, and we can do something like that. So basically saying that we don't want anything that has a net value, because that would be invalid for trading. And we can update the eligible to be, it's basically we want it to be eligible um, in the sense that it's already sampled. And also at the same time that the alpha value is not null. So, okay, so I think that is the alpha computation. Okay, um, now what we want to do is perhaps update this to use the values that we computed. So let's try for the ins and eligibles. Alpha scores is equals to sub dot ds instrument dot date alpha. So what this does is it'll go to the date and then it'll find the alpha value that we already computed, right? And the rest of that we're gonna assume that we are still doing a long short basket. And well, I mean the rest of the computation should be the same. Should there should be no change to this? So well that's good. We'll see if we can run this particular. Um, Code and let's see how it performed over the last um, 13 years or so. So let's run the back test and see how we do. Okay, and we finished our back test and. Well, luckily enough for us, uh, that was better than the random strategy. So that's good. Uh, this will be our first alpha. Uh, we're going to continue to work on this, but for now, um, we tested in 20 tickers and we got this result over the last 13 years. So, so congratulations on your first strategy. Uh, we're going to go ahead and implement the next strategy right away. Uh, we want to demonstrate three in total, and then we will show other important concepts in programming and improve our uh, library altogether. So I'll see you in the next class.